Robert, I'm really looking forward to discussing the Barbican. I, I used to talk about it 30 years ago with our former colleague and friend, Michael Lancaster, and his view was that it was a terrible place. And I used to say, no, it's half terrible and it's half very good. He said, no, Tom, come, I'll show you. <laughs> You're making a mistake. There's nothing good about it. I, I, what I think is that he used to come here for concerts and so he probably came on sort of dark, cold nights, and I imagine him wandering about on the podium saying, Help! I'm lost! Does anybody know where there's a concert? <laughs> but, so that's my view. Half good, half bad. What do you think? Well, that was going to be my question to you. Define the, the, what's half good about it and what's half bad about it. In terms of its original aim, one of the things that it definitely has achieved is uh, to get people living in the city of London again. It was originally proposed in the 1950s, and uh, now there are 4,000 people living in, uh, in, in the city once more. Yes, 4,000. I think that's half the population of the city of London, which is pretty remarkable. And I looked up some statistics. I hope they're correct. It says that it's a 40-acre estate of which... There are 23 acres of public open space, and of that, 12 acres is podium, and 11 acres is the rest, which is, I suppose, mainly private. And so I think my simple summary would be, is that with the exception of the terrace outside the cafe, I think that the public space is pretty awful, and the private green space is exceptionally good. I can't think of any space as good as that that's been made on housing estates since the war. I wouldn't say awful. I, I would be more analytical about the uh, so many of the public w walkways. They're plain, they're uh, open, and um, they're in some places rather windswept, but they lack uh, interest in terms of street interest. They're, they're not streets that you can walk along and look through shop windows. Yeah. Alistair Cook apparently said that said it's a cross between a medieval fortress and the worst of Le Corbusier. Well, medieval fortress, would, given that it was originally the Roman Barbican, uh, would seem to, 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 to tally. I, I think it's got elements of sculptural, three-dimensional feel about it, uh, which is very good. And I'm very keen on the, uh, the concrete, it chipped concrete. We can, we can feel it here, which is, is full of interest. Robert, are you coming out as an admirer of brutalism? I've always been an admirer of concrete and its plastic abilities. I never thought of this as being a brutalist uh, estate. It was designed in the late 50s, while I was still at uh, school. Um, and uh, it was built through the 1960s and finished in 72, I think it was. And my definitions of brutalism, uh, the coinage used by Rainer Bannum, uh, but the work of, uh, say, Alex Hardy at uh, Cambridge University in their architecture school, they did an extension. Interesting comparison, actually, since thinking about Corbusier with the Capitol complex at Chandigarh. And the comparison is that the, the architecture is better at Chandigarh. Corbusier was a, a more talented designer than Chamberlain Powell and Bond. But the public space is much, much better at the Barbican than it is at Chandigarh. Even the bad public space is much better. My version is it would be the difference between uh, Palladianism and, and Baroque. Um, Corbusier's work is uh, very dynamic um, sculptural work, while uh, Chamberlain Bonham Powell's work here is much more mannered, much more uh, sedate, uh, but not necessarily better or worse. I think it's uh, r rather charming in its, its English, uh, Englishness. The, the public open space at Chandigarh lacks social, aesthetic and ecological quality. The space at the Barbican, I think of the public podium space now, under the Pilates and uh, between the Pilates and the balconies, it's windy, exposed, it's, it's got no social, no aesthetic, no ecological qualities. 
But the sunken courtyards, I think, are very interesting because so often architect designed courtyards on the scale of light wells are just useless space. They let the light in and they don't do anything else at all, like the courtyards at Stockwell Street. But the courtyards at the Barbican really are like London squares, but but they're better. They're, they're enclosed at all four corners, like the plaza at the Rockefeller Center, and that they're good ecologically, socially, visually. Let me explain about the walkways here. They're based on a theory that there should be separation of the motor car and uh, pedestrians, which in a sense was a, a noble theory. It was particularly promulgated by uh, Colin Buchanan. And so the idea both here and throughout the City of London was in fact to have a, a first, first floor walkway free of the motor car. Now we can accept that streets should be full of life, should have shop fronts, should be full of interest, should have pedestrians, but can have vehicle access as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a very fair point and doubtless correct. They thought that it would extend across the city and if it had, then it would be a much more useful structure. But... They also had the idea, coming from Christopher Wren, that it was a good idea to, to replan London's street network and to modernise the city. I think they probably thought that all those buildings in the city were obsolete and needed to be replaced. And so they thought that they could redo the street pattern and redo the pedestrian circulation and create a city of tomorrow, a Corbusier city. Comprehensive redevelopment was the, the term that was, was used. Don't get me wrong, I, I think the uh, Colin Buchanan idea of uh, segregated tra- traffic and uh, uh, pedestrian walkways was a, not a, a good idea. It's a misconceived idea. I'm simply mentioning it because that was the aspiration of the, of the, of the time. And I think it's well illustrated here because the walkways are mundane, lacking in interest, unfriendly. No, that's right. I, I just can't think of any city where it's worked. It was a failure. Sad. Um, I think you can find uh, probably e- examples of themed supermarket developments in, in the state, which are several stories up. And the, yes, the example here would be at Canary Wharf, where its segregation of quite an extensive sort has worked, remembering that uh, Canary Wharf, the so-called ground level, is about seven levels below. True, but it is also at ground level. And that was really the way to do it. If you want to put the cars underground, then you should have dug tunnels. Instead of putting the pedestrians up in the air, you should put the cars under the ground. Tom, they did put the pedestrians up in the air at Canary Wharf. It's a structure of about seven stories high, which then reaches the level that everybody thinks of as the ground level. No, that's not right. The vehicular... I know about the underground levels, but the circulation level around Canada Square is, what, about two metres above water level. And so that was the old level of the keys between the docks. it, it, It is about... One and a half, two metres above that level. But it's not the six metres, which is what you've got for the podium at the Barbican. I'd just like to get back to why it is that the courtyards are so successful. And I I think it's partly the physical aspect that I mentioned, but it's also that it's private space for the residents. And for some reason, possibly because of providing space for the public through planning gain, so much of the open space that's provided around apartment blocks in London has been wasted space. It's been slope. It's been space left over after planning. It's just been grass paving, paths for fire escapes. Whereas here, because it's either communal to the residents or there are small private gardens for the residents, it seems to me it's worked dazzlingly well. One of the great things about the Barbican is not only has it been built, it's clearly a very expensive development, but it's been maintained remarkably well. 
money has been put into the maintenance, for which we have to thank the, the City of London, the Corporation of London, who are the uh, d developers here. Uh, so in a sense, it's a, uh, an example of st uh, state-funded and uh, state-run uh, d development. Uh, it's Corporation of London. And uh, uh, as a result, there's been uh, redevelopment. Uh, there's been making good, uh, which you so often don't get with uh, what you think of as ordinary council estates. It would, in fact, be really good to see public bodies still engaged in land development for private housing. You know, because they've got long-term interests and a concern for the public good, they are in a position to do much better than private developers, and we don't see enough of it. Uh, I think both, both in relation to uh, local authority housing development and also housing association development, that can apply both in on profit-making and uh, part of our problem at the moment is we're not providing nearly enough housing in the country as, as, as a whole. Completion levels are down to uh, early 1920s. There's also an interesting professional question. I wonder who designed the, the private open space at the Barbican. Did they employ a landscape architect or was it the, the architects who did it? And I also wonder very much if they had employed a landscape architect on the podium spaces, which are so bleak, if they might have got a much better result than they have got. Even now, I think they should commission a landscape architect to review those spaces. They need to respect the historic character, but much could be done to make them better than they currently are. I'm trying to think of the comparison, and it's the estate just south of uh, Paddington, uh, where uh, there was a landscape architect uh, involved. I'll have to come, ba come, come back to that. In terms of the Barbican, uh, I don't think either of us know the uh, original history of what happened in the 1960s, and we need to find out more. That's going to be, appear in the number two video that we produce on the Barbican, hopefully next year. Uh, but um, there have been landscape architects involved since. In the early 1990s, Janet Jack, uh, Building Design Partnership, was commissioned uh, particularly to look at the uh, the public uh, areas. And most recently, Nigel Dennett at the University of Sheffield has been uh, redoing uh, the uh, the planting in the areas that were uh, laid out by Janet Jack. Yes, Nigel Dennett has done a good job with regard to the aesthetics and also with regard to the sustainability aspect of the planting. I don't think he had the opportunity, it probably wasn't in his commission, to consider the social aspect of the spaces he looked at. An, an example that interests me is Jellicoe's Motopia, which also has sunken courtyards and also has a large communal space and also has strips of private garden space adjoining the blocks. That was published in 1961. And it, it's possible that it influenced Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn. I don't know. Pure speculation. Uh, it's the, the water gardens south of Paddington Station that I'm trying to think of. Who designed it? Philip Hicks. Philip person. Hicks, uh, who's not much known. We, we need to have a seminar about the work of Philip Hicks because it's a splendid development and shows what could have happened at the Barbican. There's a real integration of public space and uh, water and uh, shows really what's been lost here, or the, the opportunity not, not taken. Um, in terms of Nigel Dunnett's work, to say that he was very much working within the constraints or within the areas as set by Janet Jack. Janet Jack converted areas, planters basically, which were brick-edged uh, into areas which were otherwise simply just brick uh, paving, great plains of brick paving. And uh, as I understand it, uh, well, certainly from what I can see, Nigel Dunnett has been working within that uh, uh, constraint. What doesn't appear to have happened, both in the early 1990s or, or has been any consideration of the overall water circulation throughout the estate, with the ideas of uh, reusing water, collecting water, and feeding the water into the, the pools and, and, and fountains, uh, and also using it in irrigation. And unless I'm wrong, I think that's a huge opportunity not taken. The other uh, issue is the extent of the uh, roof garden planting. And I'm not clear as to whether that is being tackled in the, the current re refurbishment. Although the areas might not be usable, it would 
slow down water and relieve the, the drainage. It would be a very good thing in terms of sustainable urban drainage. Sounds. The project I've seen cited as an influence on the Barbican is Dolphin Square in Pimlico, which was, what, 1939, I think. And it's got a comparable use of terrace blocks to create courtyard-type spaces, but no podium and not the brutalist towers that you've got at the Barbican. I think at the spaces, the courtyards at the Barbican are better than the courtyard spaces at Dolphin Square. Do you agree? Well, they're more open, rather tight courtyards, uh, orientated uh, towards the river, so that would be um, not north-south, I think it's the east-west orientation. And they catch quite a lot of sunlight, but you feel very enclosed within those courtyards. And then the, uh, the treatment, or the landscaping, is, uh, the landscape design, is very neoclassical in a rather wishy-washy 1930s way. But it's a pleasant place at the, at the Dolphin Square. Uh, it's a, but it's a pleasant place to live and, and to use. I mean, I used to play squash there in the 1970s and swim there as well. well Robert, it's a pity Michael Lancaster's not here to put us both right, but it seems we're agreeing with each other and disagreeing with him. We, we seem to think that the Barbican is half very good and half not very good. But the point is, the half that's not very good can be put right. Yes.